Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Your attention to the book of 2 Kings chapter number 9, verse number 30. Second Kings 9, verse number 30. Amen. How many is thankful for the goodness of the Lord? So excited about those that received the Holy Ghost <clears throat> today and for what God is doing. Thank you to all that have been praying and fasting. I do want to just drop in your mind. We're really, I'm really excited and I know you are as well. Um, Easter is coming up. I believe it's April the 17th and uh, it's been, I guess, since uh, 2019 since we've had uh, our big Easter drama. And uh, some, some have been asking, and yes, we are going uh, to be having a big Easter drama this year, Forgiven. And I believe God wants to reach all across this Inland Empire and touch hearts and minds. I would like us just to be praying about that. Just be praying that there's a sovereign touch of the Holy Ghost. And uh, we just want to see this place packed out that weekend. People touch, lives changed, filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So let's be thinking about that, praying about that. We'll be talking more about that as that approaches. Amen. How many love Jesus tonight? Amen. So good to see brother and sister Claiborne, all of our guests. God bless you. We're so glad you're with us in the house of the Lord. 2 Kings 9, verse number 30. The Bible says, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her head or adorned her head and looked out at the window. I want you to notice she was at the window. The Bible says in verse 31, And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master. And he lifted up his face to the window. Everybody say the window. And said, who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. These were the palace eunuchs. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trode her underfoot. Amen. It's a violent passage of scripture, but I want to just tell you, sometimes that spirit of Jezebel, you got to deal with it because the window matters. Amen. Vision matters. I want to preach to us about vision tonight, and I believe the Lord wants to help us uh, reset some things. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here. I believe God wants to to burn into our spirit some things tonight. I believe he wants to, to focus some things, to calibrate some things tonight. Hallelujah. I believe the Lord is here to do that. Amen. Anybody going to help Lord have his way tonight? Am I going to respond to the word of the Lord? Let's pray together. Let's open our hearts and our minds. Let's talk to him right now. Ask that God would bless the next few minutes, Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. Anoint your people, God. Your word is already anointed. Anoint me to preach. God, give us ears to hear and a heart to understand. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. And God bless you. Be seated in Jesus' name. Vision in the word of the Lord is something that God insists on. God is insistent that the people of God individually and then as a church corporately, that we have a, a view and a vision that matches his vision. 
Vision is, is, is really not optional. It's not up for grabs. <clears throat> In the Bible, both directly and uh, in, 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 in just in black and white makes this insistence that the people of God have to be people of vision. And the word of God also uh, illustrates this truth that vision is necessary in a lot of different types and shadows. One of the types and shadows wherein the Bible insists Upon the need for vision is found in Genesis chapter number 6 with Noah and the ark. And the Bible has said that God was going to destroy the earth with a flood. But thank God that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God began to speak to Noah about the construction of the ark. And he's very specific about how he wanted the ark to be built. He said... Several things that he wanted in the ark. He wanted there to be various rooms in the ark. That is, there was a, a place for everything. And I, I believe that the church of the living God must have this. There are, there are various rooms in the church. And I don't mean physically, but I mean that in type and shadow, there is room for everybody. Aren't you glad there's room for everybody in this place tonight there's room for different personalities there are room for different ways of looking uh, at the world that that God has given people different insights and different ways of, of, of thinking there's room for all kinds of different people I just I'm glad that God has given us variety in the church Amen. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll let the variety frustrate us when really it's one of the beautiful things about living for God. I'm thankful for the church of the living God and brothers and sisters in this church. I'm glad there's room for all of us in this place. The Bible said in the ark, not only was there individual rooms, but he told Noah he wanted him to uh, waterproof it, to pitch it within and without on the inside and the outside. And this is a, a reference, of course, that it matters how the church is prepared inwardly. Amen. I believe God cares about our inward spirit. David said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Church, we need our hearts to be right before God. The Bible says also, though, that the outward mattered. It had to be waterproofed on the outside. Church, this church does have an exterior that matters. And anybody that tells you that outward holiness and standards are no longer matter, they are not your friend. More importantly, they are not speaking truth. The Word of God established then and now that God cares about His people being a holy people. Amen. I want this church to be what God wants it to be within. But I also want to be the outward representation of God Himself in the world. Anybody want to be what God wants us to be with holiness. The Bible says that Noah's Ark had specific dimensions. Amen. And it, this church has got to be built the right way. The Bible said that Noah's Ark had one door. I could talk a lot about that. How many know that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all who's above all, through all, and in you all. You ain't coming into the church any other way than through Jesus Christ. I didn't say that. I didn't start that. But if you're thinking that's exclusive, talk to Jesus. He said, I am the way. Not Buddha. Jesus is the way. Not Confucius. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus. Not Joseph Smith. Not Father Divine. Not not any of the others that would say you come through me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one door, and anybody comes any other way, they're a thief, they're a robber. Amen. This church has one door, and it's an Acts 238 Jesus name door. Repentance. Baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. I'm thankful there's a door in this place, and I'm coming through the door. Amen. But in all of this that God 
gave to Noah one of the things that he insisted on with all of the above in mind. God told Noah, I want you to have in the ark not just a door, not just rooms, not just certain waterproof requirements, but I want you to have a a window in the ark. A window in the ark. I want you, Noah, when you plan this thing, to think about it ahead of time. There is a, and there must be, a window through which you can see out of the ark. Amen. And we know that this window played an important role later when they were to disembark from the ark. It was through that window that Noah with the dove, kind of sending out his his, um, ancient version of, uh, what do you call those things? that Drones, thank you. He sent out a dove drone, and then he sent out a, a raven drone, and then he sent out a dove drone. In order, to find, in order to find whether or not it was time for them to come out of the ark. In the ark, God said, you have to be able to see. You have to have vision in the ark. And church, I want to tell us tonight that there is something that God is insistent on. It is something that he, he remarks on over and over. And if, if you're wondering, your, your pastor wants to reflect God's insistence to us in saying that there is a vision that we must have as the church of God. I don't want this to be a church that's only inward. I I want you to understand I am concerned about the church being taken care of. One of the things I live with daily is the injunction in Acts 20 and 28 where Paul is telling the elders of Ephesus, Take heed to yourselves that you feed the flock of God. I think daily on some version of the words of Jesus. I believe it's in John 20 when he told Peter, if you love me, if you love me, feed my sheep. I care about that. I think about that. It's on me. And I I want you to be the healthiest church that we can possibly be by the teaching and the preaching, by your own personal devotions and prayer, reading your Bible. But I want to tell you at the end of the day, church, we can never be a church without windows. We can never be a church without vision. We can never be a church that only thinks inward about us and how we can somehow survive this dark world. I'm going to tell you a church that lives that way is a church that is a dying church. A church that has no vision outside of itself is a church that will self-destruct church that does not see outside of its walls is a church that is shrinking. A church that cannot see that this world needs Jesus is a church that is not fitting the model that Jesus had in mind. But I tell you tonight, and I believe I've got a bunch of people that that embrace this truth, the church has windows. The church has vision. The church, it's a beautiful church what's here tonight, but I'm going to tell you, It's bigger than what is here tonight. When my dad was teaching this morning and he made this he made the statement about about the he was he was likening the church to Solomon's temple that was assembled elsewhere and all the parts were put together and the hammering and the and the 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 carving and the putting together of the stones and and then they were brought to one local place, the place of the construction of the temple, and it was assembled beautifully. Oh man, when he was saying there was something stirring in my heart, I was thinking, oh God, how beautiful what we are a part of. Hallelujah. Churches all across America, all across the world right now being assembled. Things like this are happening on Sunday nights uh, all across North America as churches are being uh, constructed by the power of God. There needs to be a vision of what we're a part of. This is bigger than you and me. This is bigger than you and me. Oh, hallelujah. This is bigger than you and me just surviving. This church does not have a hold the fort mentality. This church is not about us four and no more. But there's a world that's lost going to hell that needs the one God message. They need the door. And so we've got to have a window where we can see the world that's lost that needs Jesus. Oh, let's lift our hands and let God talk to us about it right now. Hallelujah. Amen. We've got to have windows. Windows are a place of vision. 
windows are a place where you can see. Amen. When you don't have vision, I'm going to tell you, stagnation occurs. I, I, I read some, some quotes of people that lived a while back that made some predictions. They, were, they had no vision. One man made this statement. His name is Simon Newcomb. How many have heard of Simon Newcomb? I doubt you have, Peyton. You know why you haven't heard of Simon Newcomb? Because he didn't have much vision. He made this statement. He said, flights by machines heavier than air is impractical and insignificant, if not utterly impossible. This was made in 1902, one year before somebody you have heard of. The Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk flew the first airplane. He had no vision. The statement, this statement was made by the American Road Congress in 1913. How many heard of the American Road Congress? I don't know who they are. Maybe it became the Department of Transportation or whatever. The, I don't know who they are. But they made this statement. It, that would explain some potholes in the road. They said this, It is an idle dream to imagine that automobiles will take the place of railways in the long-distance movement of passengers. I'm here to tell you they had no vision. Robert Milliken, un unbelievably, he was the Nobel winner in physics. We probably, many of you had heard of Robert Milliken in 1920s, but he made this statement, which I'm sure he regretted later. There is no likelihood that man can ever tap the power of the atom. I'm sure if he had lived another 20 years, he understood I made a big mistake. Amen. Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM in 1943, said, I think... There is a world market for about five computers. Can I tell you, probably in your purse, some of you have more than five computers. Amen. Somebody said that was a part of the Digital Equipment Corporation, Ken Olson, in 1977. This is not too long ago. There is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. I'm here to tell you, Ken, you missed it and you missed it bad. There's a bunch of people that have computers in their home. Church, we've got to have vision. We've got to see it the way God wants us to see it. Amen. When you look at windows in your Bible, it's amazing how, much, how many significant things happened at windows. The Bible says in Genesis 26, it was, in, in the, it was at a window that Abimelech realized that Isaac had lied to him about Isaac's wife being his sister. I'm going to tell you, vision will help you to discover truth. We read in Proverbs chapter 7, it's where the father is talking to his son. And at the window, he said he saw some things, some scary things that were coming after his boy. Amen. Parents, we need to have vision for our children. Amen. We need parents that don't have their head in the sand, that have a Holy Ghost sensitivity Amen. We got to see. We got to believe. We got we to gotta understand our kids. They're, they're, it's a scary world. But at the same time, I tell you, there's a God in heaven that can not just keep our kids, but he can lift them up and make them mighty people, saints of God in these last days. We've got to have vision. Amen. I will tell you that vision is necessary. Vision brings deliverance. It's amazing how many times in your Bible it was through a window that deliverance came. The Bible says in Joshua 2, just quickly, Rahab let, let, um, uh, let two, the two spies that Joshua had sent into Jericho, she let them down from a window. The Bible says in 1 Samuel that Michael uh, let David down when he was fleeing from Saul through a window. In 1 Kings 13, it was Elisha with King Joash. If you'll remember the story, he has the arrows and he tells them at a window to fire those arrows. And he said after uh, Joash had hit the ground only three times, he said you should have done it five or six times because those arrows are the symbol of the Lord's deliverance. In 2 Corinthians 11, the Bible says that Paul was let down. He, was, he escaped through a window. I'm going to tell you, vision is necessary. For a church, if we really want deliverance in this place, we've got to be a church that can see all that God wants us to see. Amen. I'm here to tell you, we got to see that there's growth. There's expansion. There's Holy Ghost revival. 
There is in-gathering waiting. Some of you need to have vision for your jobs, vision on a personal level. God wants you to have new jobs. God wants you to be promoted on the job. Oh, hallelujah. God wants to give you vision to what decisions to make with your job. Amen. I, I didn't intend to say this, but I rebuke the thought that says, I can't live in California because of the economy. I'm here to tell you, God is God in California. And God can bless you in California. And can I point out the obvious? There's 40 million people that somehow are making it and not all of them are Elon Musk. I'm here to preach to you that God can give you vision. Pay your tithes. Be a wise steward of God's money and pray and have vision and say, Lord, if I'm making minimum wage, you can bless me on the job. You can increase me on the right hand and the left hand. I've come against that in Jesus' name. There's blessing for you. There's provision. Oh, come on now. Some of you that have been listening to a lie, I preach to you tonight. To look out the window. There's a God that can do great things, mighty things. He can bless your business. He can give you a business. He can give you a side business. He can grow your business. Have vision for your family. Come on, let God expose you to bigger ideas. Give you largeness of heart. Get Reject small thinking. Jesus, you can do it. You can do it. Come on, open the window. Somebody needs to pull back the curtain. Let the light shine. Come on, pray with me right now. I believe vision wants to come into this house in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. I'm going to tell you windows and vision are important, and listen to me. They can be a dangerous place because they are so important. you got to approach vision properly. You don't play games with vision. Amen. you got to have the right attitude when it comes to a vision. When God speaks something, you better not yawn. When God begins to speak, don't you say, I've heard that before. You need to stand up. And say, God, if you speak it, I receive it. Be it unto me according to thy word. Amen. If you close your eyes at the place of vision, I'm going to tell you, it can be dangerous. Amen. I read in Acts 20 about a young man by the name of Eutychus. Amen. Paul's preaching. The Bible says he preached so long it was midnight. Amen. In case you ever get to thinking I preach a little bit long. Amen. I take comfort in Acts 20. I've never yet preached till midnight, but I got, I got a bunch of years ahead of me one of these days. Hallelujah. I remember hearing about J.T. Pugh. He literally preached for five hours. There were two guests that showed up. He preached for about two or three hours. They said, dude, I'm out of here. He said, I'm gone too. Let's go. They went to lunch and they ate and they got done and they were driving by the church and there was a bunch of cars in the parking lot. They said, do you reckon those crazy people are still in there? And they went inside, and he was still preaching, preached for five hours. Somebody asked Brother Pew later, why'd you, why, why'd you preach so long? He said, because I had a lot to say. Amen. Well, Paul must have had a lot to say in Acts 20. Amen. He's preaching. I'm going to tell you, preaching is a place of vision. Hallelujah. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm casting vision. I'm preaching. And I'm bringing vision. It's not because of me. It's just the way God established it. Through the foolishness of preaching, there's lights that are turned on. Through the foolishness of preaching, the darkness is pushed back. Through the foolishness of preaching, people begin to wake up and say, Oh, my God, even in 2022, it's revival time. As I'm preaching right now, God's come to shake some of you. God's come to stir some of you. The power of the Holy Ghost has come to reach into this house and say if the vision is preached, it will happen. It will happen. It will happen. Somebody needs to rub your eyes. Somebody needs to, come on, come on, push back the darkness. Rub the sleep out of your eyes. Come on, Eutychus. It's a dangerous place to be asleep in the window. Amen. The Bible says this young man literally fell asleep at church in the window. Fell out of the window. Can you imagine? 
I've, I've been in church. I've never seen that happen. I think I've seen people almost fall out of a chair asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I've almost seen that. And, uh, but I'm talking falling out of a window. And the Bible says he fell out, fell to his death. Uh, oh, help us, Jesus. I, I'm going to tell you, it's a dangerous place to, to approach God's vision casually. Uh, amen. You don't come to his house. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about some of you men that work hard and get sleepy in church. I ain't talking about that. Uh, but I'm talking about a spiritual slumber. I'm talking about a spirit that says uh, I'm going to approach God's ways and God's word casually. I'm not talking about physical sleep, but I'm talking about apathy. I'm going to tell you when the preaching's going forth, stir yourself up, preach the word. Hallelujah. There needs to be a yay and an amen. Hallelujah. We can never settle for dead church. We can never settle for dead church. And I don't just mean on Sunday night. I'm going to tell you, Wednesday and Sunday morning, stir yourself. Preach, preacher. Preach. It ain't just about you. There's people there that need a church that's stirred up. They need a church that's receiving the word of God. They need a church that has shook themselves out of apathy and says, preach the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. It's a dangerous place to be apathetic in the window of vision. Amen. You got to be careful how you approach vision. Amen. You, you can't, there's no room for pride when vision is there. Amen. I, I think of a woman by the name of Michael. Michael, the one that just a few chapters before had let David out through a, a window of vision. Amen. That, that used to know how to deal with vision. She used to have vision. She used to say that vision, that window is a way of escape. But we read where later somehow something happened to her spirit. Pride rose up in her. Do you know how long I've lived for God? Do you know who I am? Whatever the case, do you know? Whatever it was, pride slipped into her spirit. And she saw out the window her husband David. And David was rejoicing in God. They were bringing the Ark of the Covenant home. And that dude was anything but proud. Amen. He had the, king, he had the crown on his head. But like Brother Bass preaches, before he was ever king, he was a worshiper. Amen. And can I tell somebody before you're ever boss on the job, you're a worshiper. Don't come to church acting like a boss. Come acting like a worshiper. Amen. Before you're ever the superintendent, you're a worshiper. Before you're ever the boss, you're a worshiper. Before you're the ever whatever your job is, you're a worshiper. Come on, take that crown off. Shout unto God. Come on, don't tell me I'm a, I'm a preacher. I don't worship God. That, no, no, no. Before you're a preacher, you're a worshiper. Before you're a Bible study teacher, you're a shouter. Before you're an usher, you're a praiser. Come on, everybody praise him right now. Whoa. Hallelujah, I don't want a spirit of pride to choke me in the window of vision. Amen, Michael saw a worshiper out there. Amen, and somehow pride came on the scene, and she mocked him, and she despised him. And somehow a woman that used to know about vision, that knew vision was an escape from David, now looking through vision is mocking a worshiper. And the Bible says that, that I don't, I, we don't know the details for sure, but from that day again she never bore a child to David. Amen. Whether God struck her, struck her with barrenness or David said, woman, you and I are done. Whatever the case, I'm going to tell you, pride will bring barrenness. Pride will bring barrenness to your family. Lack of, of oh, I'm just going to tell you, if you don't, if you're too proud to worship, you're too proud to be a child of God. If you're too proud to be a worshiper, God will shut you off and shut you down. You'll be barren in your home, barren in your marriage, barren on the job. Come on, you'll wonder where the blessings of God went. I've come to tell you, you need to rebuke pride. I'm in the place of vision. God can do anything. 
God can do anything. When I see a worshiper, I'm going to shout with them. I'm going to rejoice with them. I may not be able to run like I used to, but I'm going to run as fast as I can. I may not be able to jump as high as I used to, but I'm going to jump as high as I can. I'm going to clap. I'm going to lift my voice. Oh, somebody ought to praise the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, praise him. Praise him with your hands. Praise him with your mouth. Praise him with your feet. Praise him in the dance. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated or you can stand. I'm going to preach for a while. Amen. Whatever you feel. If you got the energy to stand there and get with me, I love it. I love it. Amen. But you're welcome to sit as well. I believe God wants to help us in the place of vision tonight. Amen. Amen. Another danger in vision we read is in our text tonight. A lady by the name of Jezebel. The Bible that says that they're in the place of vision, in the window. The Bible says that Jehu had come, and apparently in an effort to seduce him, we think perhaps to distract him from the purpose that God had given him. The Bible says that she painted her face. She, she made up herself. She, she began to prepare herself. And as you know, Jezebel is a symbol, a type. She's a type of rebellion, and she's a type of worldliness. And church, I'm going to tell you, we need to beware of rebellion. And we got to beware of worldliness in the place of vision. It's no time to be saying, you know, little things are okay now. Amen. If the Bible talks about it, we need to obey the word of God. Amen. I'm, I'm here to tell you again that Hollywood is still an offense in the nostrils of God. The Bible says don't bring an abomination into your house lest you become cursed like it. I'm here to tell you Hollywood is not pleasing to God. The Bible says in Romans 1, it talks about the sins of the world. And then it says, be careful that you're not one of those that take pleasure in them that do them. I may not murder, but I enjoy murder. I may not commit adultery, but I enjoy watching it. I, I may not be a homosexual, but I enjoy watching it. I, I, I may not be a liar or a cheat or a drunk or an alcoholic, but I enjoy watching it on the screen. Church, I'm here to tell you, we still preach from the Bible that Hollywood has no place in a church with vision. Hallelujah. And can I tell you tonight, you need to be careful. You need to be careful. Amen. There's a danger of going to a good church. There's a danger of going to a good church. The danger is you can come and coast sometimes. You can come and coast on somebody else's conviction. You can slip around and watch it on YouTube or watch it on your phone or watch it wherever it's at. I'm talking about Hollywood now. And I'm here to tell you, and, and you may be okay. The presence of the Lord may still be in the house of God. But I'm going to tell you, something's happening in your heart. Something's happening in your spirit. Jezebel, watch out. Look out. I'm going to tell you, not in the way place of vision. No, 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 no. You need to get that spirit out. Hallelujah. Because I'm here to tell you there's a God he'll put up with it for so long and then he will move you out. Hallelujah. Amen. We want you here. We love you. But let me just preach to you from my heart. Vision is beautiful. And Jezebel's ways have no part in the kingdom of God. Television and Hollywood and the things of this world. You know why God's presence is here? There's a lot of reasons. But I'm going to tell you, there's some elders like the Moors that purposed a long time ago. We're going to be holy as he is holy. 
We've got conviction. It's not just a preacher's conviction. We've got conviction. We've fallen in love with Jesus. There's some young couples that said, I'm going to live for Jesus. There's some teenagers that in 2022 said, I'm going to buck the tide of this world. It's not just my dad's conviction. It's not just my grandfather's conviction. This is not just an old man's message. Come on, anybody got that spirit in you? Mary, do you feel that way? Do you love this truth? Do you love the holiness of God? Come on, young men. Anybody love this apostolic way? Anybody want to contend for the vision? Clap your hands and give him praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, you can get used to looking at the world weird. You can get loose, used to a distorted type of vision. I heard about a, an experiment that they did at the Hanover Institute in Germany in the late 19th century. They took a bunch of people, and they put goggles on them. And these goggles had inverting lens. What it did was it, make, it would make the world look upside down. I'd be looking at Celeste and Francis, and they would be standing, well, on the ground, but upside down. You understand that's a little bit confusing. That's a little bit discombobulating. That'll, that'll mess you up. And, and then you, you, if you were to speculate on how, what that would do, what would happen to your mind, that many of us would probably think that after a while you'd just kind of learn how to live in an upside down world. But what really happened is after time, it took longer for some people than others, but as wearing those goggles, as they wore those goggles, their minds, their brains would switch what they were seeing and flip it upside down. And so they began to see the world as normal. Amen. An upside down world became normal. I'm here to tell you, I don't want my vision to be so confused that I learned to live with an upside down world. I refuse to live with a view that says my problems are big and God is small. I reject the spirit that says my problems are bigger than God. I'm going to tell you, that's an upside down vision. You know what God's trying to do? He's trying to rip some of those goggles off your eyes tonight. Amen. Some of you over the last while, I don't know how long, you've got used to an upside down world. You've drank from the media's cup. You've drank from Hollywood's cup. You've drank from every cup but the word of God. And you've begun to accept that my problems are big and God is small. I've come to tell you, God is big. And compared to God, your problems are small. Oh, some of you don't like this because what's happening is your vision's getting flipped. You know what you need to do? You need to grab your goggles off and throw them out. Come on, come on, get rid of that vision that the world gave you. Get rid of that vision that your college professor tried to give you. Get rid of that vision that academia is putting in front of you. Fox News doesn't tell me what to think. CBS doesn't tell me how to think. I'm going to tell you, I've never met more scared people in my life. That doesn't mean we're not prudent and wise. But sometimes I think, you know what? I can almost tell how much television people watch by how scared they are. You didn't like that, but it was right anyway. I've come to preach. Get the goggles off. Get back in the book. God's big. God's big. Oh. Come on, a world's starting to flip for somebody. Somebody's world's starting to flip. Come on, God's here to invert your vision. He's trying to give you a new way of looking at life. He's in control. He's on the throne. He rules and reigns. He's the omnipotent God that sits high. Somebody ought to give him praise right now. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Amen. You're going to help me preach a little bit. You can be seated or you can stand, whatever you want. Amen. We got to have a vision that's right. Somebody say we got to have vision. Amen. Amen. We got to see the church the way God does. And that ain't easy all the time because there's a million things that are distorting. But I'm going to tell you, we got to see it the way it really is. 
I'm, I'm not here, I'm not saying we need to see the world through a fake view, some kind of rose-tinted view. But I'm also telling you we can't see the world with lenses that are tinted by cynicism. We can't see the world through the lenses that are tinted by sin. Come on, we got to see the church the way God sees it. Amen. This last week I've been praying, God, let me see the church right. God, let me see these precious saints the way you do. He shed his blood. I'm going to tell you, you don't put your tongue on the church. Don't you lift any other institution higher than the church. No other institution higher than the church. Your work's not higher than the church. Your job's not more important than the church. Your school's not more important than the church. Don't you tell me your co-workers are more important than these people. I, I tell you tonight, you need to see the church the way God sees it. And if you don't, you need to repent. You need to pray through. You need to say, wash me with your blood. Jesus is saying, these are mine. These are the apple of my eye. You touch them and I flinch. I protect them. I shed my blood for them. I will went to Calvary for them. I shed precious blood. I was crucified on a cross for the men and women in this house. We got to see the church right. Amen. And I'm going to tell you the church is God's institution in the world. Amen. Let me just tell you the church is doing all right. Oh, hallelujah. You want to know how to see the church? You don't see the church through your eyesight. You see the church through the word. Because your eyes are one of the most deceitful things in the world. Amen. God said in Isaiah 11 and 3, speaking of the Messiah, he would not judge even Messiah after the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears. But he would be of quick understanding, quick scented. He would deal spiritually instinctiveness. Oh, oh, oh God. Help us to reject what our eyes see. Let there be a spiritual sensitivity that begins to emerge in this house. I don't want to see this church the way I, my eyes see it, but I want to see my brothers and sisters the way you see it. You want to see the word or the church? Look at the through the lens of the word. Here's the biblical vision of the church. Are you ready? The Bible says that Jesus might present it to himself, a glorious church. Somebody say glorious. glorious. Hallelujah. Church ain't sick. Church isn't going down. I'm going to tell you the global church is doing quite well. Let me just add to that Inland Lighthouse Church. It's a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That it should be holy and without blemish. You need to see the church right. Matthew 16, he said of the church, this is the vision. You got to see it through upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, shall not, not maybe won't, but I, or, or there's a possibility that the gates of hell might have their way. But I tell you, Jesus said emphatically, he, he, he settled it, and God's word is settled. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right now, God's here to give somebody new vision. He said of the church, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation is the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. He said of Zion, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. I've come to tell you that the church is beautiful. The song says it like this, it's been through the storm, but the wind couldn't turn it. It's been through the fire. But the fire couldn't burn it. Let me add a little course or a little line to that. It's been through COVID, but COVID couldn't kill it. Fed to the lions, but the lions couldn't eat it. Fought a lot of wars, but it's never been defeated. It's the church triumphant, oh Lord, and it's built 
by the hand of the Lord. The song says I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation. It's built on the rock and it's got a firm foundation. It's been through the flood and it's been through the fire. But one of these days it's going up higher. It's the church triumphant, oh Lord. And it's built by the hand of the Lord. Somebody ought to give him praise right now. It's a beautiful church. Come on, somebody ought to stand to your feet and give him praise. It's a glorious church. Somebody ought to give God a shout and thank him. It's a powerful, glorious thing. Oh, give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 Amen, amen. You can be seated. But the musicians are coming. So let that give you some hope tonight. But I've come to tell you a couple things in, in, as I move towards a close. I don't even want to say it's a closing yet. Amen. You guys doing okay still? All right. You play basketball for three hours. Amen. You can stand with the preacher for till midnight. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that vision is essential. In church, here's a couple things about vision. Vision, first of all, is, is beautiful. And vision is going to be tested. The vision that God gives, it's going to come up against trouble and trial. It's, it's going to come up against things that don't fit the vision. Church, if it's a real vision, it's gonna, there's going to be things that don't seem to match the vision that come against the people of God. I'm here to tell you the vision is beautiful. And there's a test that comes to the vision. Don't let a test make you think the vision is wrong. Don't let a trial somehow try to steal from you the vision. I was talking to somebody recently, and there was something we were thinking about working on. And I leaned over to them. God was dealing with me, and I said, you know, the vision is still beautiful. And the vision is still glorious. And it's going to be tested, but it's worth fighting for. And I've come to tell somebody tonight that the vision is still right, and we're going to contend for the vision. Amen. I read in, in, in the story of Moses, the Bible says that God gave him a vision in the Ten Commandments. You know that, right? And the Bible says that in his anger, Moses broke the Ten Commandments. But God took him and said, rewrite it just like you did before. There was still Ten Commandments. They were still part of it. It was the same thing. The vision did not change. I read about Jeremiah. God spoke to him. And he would prophesy. And he had a, a scribe by the name of Baruch that would write it down. And one day they took this, this scroll to a king. I believe it was Jehoiakim. And the Bible says that Jehoiakim had it read to him. And he didn't like what he heard. And he began to cut it with a knife, a pen knife. And throw the vision into the fire. Amen. I'm going to tell you there's times when it's going to feel like the vision is being burned up. But a mature saint of God still says the vision is beautiful. And the vision is right. And the Bible says that Jeremiah, at the instigation of God, looked at his scribe and he said, you know what? Write it again. Just like it was before. Say it the same way. And I've come to tell you tonight uh, that God's vision of the church, uh, it's a crystal clear, pristine vision. It's a one God vision. It's a Jesus name vision. It's a tongue talking vision. It's a Holy Ghost vision. It's a revival vision. It's a your neighbor's going to get saved vision. It's a backsliders are coming home vision. It's a, a bunch of people getting the Holy Ghost like they did this morning and they did tonight. Amen. It's a vision of people receiving the Holy Ghost. And I don't care what the devil sins. I don't care what the world sins. I don't care what comes against us. We're going to fight for the vision. Come on now. Has anybody got some fight in you? 
Come on, is there a man that'll stand up and say, I'm going to fight, I'm going to contend. Is there a man that as the priest of your home, as the husband, as the father of your home, would stand up and say, I'm going to contend for the vision that God has given to us? Hallelujah, I want us to stand again. I want us to lift our hands. And I want us to reach out to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, lift your voice to him. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, help me in the back. Lift your voice. Lift your voice side to side. Lift your voice. Come on, sir, contend for the vision. Oh, yes. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I remember Sister Jody Bernard telling me this. Years ago, God gave her a dream of this church. And in the dream, she... There were three preachers that prayed for her in this, this vision, this dream. And as she, when they were done praying with her, she felt the Holy Ghost so powerfully. She began to float up in this dream, in this vision, up higher and higher in the church. And the church that she was in was not the one that she was used to attending. I believe it was in the old sanctuary. It was before this ever was built. Certainly before that next one's going to be built. And in the vision, she floated up, up, and she said, what I remember is there being large glass windows. And as I'm up, I'm looking out of those windows of the church, and the parking lot was full of cars, hundreds of cars. And she said there was multitudes of people everywhere you looked, different directions they were coming, different ethnicities, different races, different class different ways of thinking because there's room in the church <laughs> and they were walking into the house of God my mother-in-law is here tonight sister Marcella Thomas precious lady of God I remember she, her saying way back in 1994 she had a vision she was going into another church but she saw a vision of a large fan-shaped church and in that church Again, she was, she, was, she was floating over that church. And she said on the right side of the platform, I, I meant to ask her, was that from the right side if you're on the platform or if you're facing the platform? Because we need to put it in the right place in that fan-shaped building. But she saw a black grand piano before she ever came to Rialto on the right side of the platform. And there were people everywhere receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. She said she had a dream later. Evangelist Cody Marks was in the dream, and he was coming out of a field, his arms loaded with, with corn, ears of corn that had already been, had the shucks removed. And you could see the corn, the ears, and, and all of the kernels were there, just a whole arm load. And he handed it to my dad. And in the dream, she asked, what does this mean? And God spoke to her and said, every kernel on that corn is a soul. I'm here to tell you the vision is of souls by the hundreds, souls by the thousands. She had a, another dream of the church, and she was, again, she was up above it somehow, and she was looking, and she saw people coming in, all kinds of people. And I'm going to just tell you the vision, because this, and if this offends you, I'm sorry, but there was lots and lots of African Americans. Hallelujah. I don't mean that it offend any, but if you're African American, don't let that offend you. Because that's what this church is headed. And in that vision, she saw lots and lots of African Americans. She said most of them were dressed in suits, women in, in, in hats and so on, like they were coming from church. And then there was like kind of another group all intermixed throughout that of, of homeless people that were coming. And, and, and she asked God, what does this mean? And she said the first group, the African Americans dressed for church, they're coming from churches that don't preach this truth. They're coming... 
They're coming. They're coming. Hallelujah. Dressed for church, ready for church. And she said all the ones that were rough and, and, and looked homeless, she said there are people coming from the streets that are hungry for God. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. I'm preaching about the vision tonight. Hallelujah. Anybody thankful for the vision? There's a man that used to attend this church years ago before we even came. His name was Ken Ellis. And Ken Ellis was a Bible study teacher. He loved souls. and he, he had a dream. He had a vision. And it was of this church. And he saw the church. And it, what was weird to him is he knew he was not a part of the church. He was not a part of the church. But he could see that the church was full of souls. There was people everywhere. And I'm thankful for the souls that are here. I know there's a bunch of people sick. But I'm thankful for how God is adding to the church. But it's been in the mind of God for a while. And baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. And Brother Ellis was like, I don't know what that means. I wasn't a part of it. And God let him know it's going to happen in Rialto. You're going to be elsewhere. But God is going to fill that church mightily. My dad was back, I believe it was in Texas. Is that where it was? And Charlotte Pound told you, or who told you? I'd like Bishop Booker to tell this, this story. This. She's in her 60s now. But she was a little girl over in the Bloomington church. Small little church. And she said, Brother Booker, I've waited for years till the right place and time to tell you this. But said, a message in tongues came. An interpretation and said it was riveting and powerful. And God said, I'm going to give this church a large piece of property. And there will be a great building built on it. And this church will have mighty, mighty revival. Mighty revival that will affect the entire Inland Empire. And she said, I was a little girl. And I thought, I looked around. And she said, okay, Jesus. She said, but I've watched what's happened in your Charles church. And I remembered that, and I said, first chance I get to see Larry Booker face to face, I'm telling him what I saw and heard when I was a little girl. <laughs> the vision is happening. Let's lift our hands and thank him for it. Come on, lift your voice and thank him for it. Yalamokotaya. Come on, thank him for it. Hallelujah. 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 You know what I feel the Holy Ghost is saying? He's saying, number one, the vision is beautiful. Number two, the vision will be tested. And number three, you got to fight for the vision. Enough rolling over and dying. Get up. Get up and say, Jesus, thank you for what you've done. Look at what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. He's blessed this church financially. We're, we're poised to pay this church off in just a few months. I wouldn't even have dreamed of it last year this time. But when Brother Howard was here, God did a miraculous thing, and you responded. And let me just add this, in the middle of all that, this church has given. Cut the microphone just for about 10 seconds. My point in that is we have not stopped giving to missions. Hallelujah. Amen. To God be the glory. God's saying it's time to fight for the vision. Somebody needs to push back the apathy. You may be older and not able to do all that you could, but do what you can. Give your talent to God. 
don't be a drain on what God is doing. Don't be a drag on what God is doing. Don't just coast and let others worship carry you. Don't let others burden carry the church. Give God your talent. He's saying, don't go to sleep in the vision. Don't be proud in the vision, Michael. Come on, come on, Michael, son of Saul, uh, daughter of Saul. Don't you be disdainful of worship, but you ought to worship like you've never worshiped before. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is saying to somebody, you need to push back against rebellion, against worldliness, against anything that would speak a counter to the vision. Somebody ought to rush to this altar right now and say, I embrace the vision. There ought to be some men that take your wife by the hand and come as consecration to God and say together, we're going to contend for the vision. Come on now. This ought to be a statement right now. Elders that respond to the preached word of God. That say I'm embracing the vision. Come on, push your way back. Take the goggles off that have inverted your seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to me. As you're coming, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. God is not small. God is not weak. God is not insignificant. The world does not dictate to God. Human events do not dictate to God. Governments do not dictate to God. The media does not dictate to revival. But I tell you tonight that God is big. And God is great. And God is in control. Come on, I feel God wanting to take somebody's vision back. He's ready to take off the goggles. He's ready to take off the false sight. He's here to help somebody right now. Come on, every hand lifted. Somebody ought to praise him. Somebody ought to rejoice. Somebody ought to get a new sight. Somebody ought to get new vision. Somebody ought to say, God, I want to see right. Oh, God is big. God is on the move. Come on, fight for the vision. Fight for the vision. Oh, somebody ought to fight for the vision. Contend for it. Lift your voice. It, God's washing somebody's eyesight. Oh, somebody's getting their window clean. Come on, come on, push Jezebel out of the window. Throw Jezebel out of the window. Throw pride out of the window. Throw unbelief out of the window. Throw worldliness out of the window. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I want to say this right now. Amen, amen. The vision will be tested, but the vision is still right. God's going to fill the house with his glory. I feel it right now. God's going to fill this house with souls. He's doing it right now. God's going to pay this thing off. He's doing it right now. That wall's coming down. That new church is going to be built. God's going to fill it with his glory. And God's going to fill it with souls. There will be, by the grace of God, daughter works scattered all across this inland empire to where nobody has to go more than 30 minutes to church i can't help if somebody's silly or if goofy things happen the vision's right the vision's right the vision's right 
and God is going to send souls and God is going to send revival and God is going to add to the church daily such as should be saved. Come on, let's praise him right now. Embrace it. Receive it. Fight for it. Fight for it. Fight for it. Somebody ought to lift your voice like a trumpet. Oh, hallelujah. 